In track and field, there's a rule regarding all sprint races that if the athlete moves within 0.1 seconds after the gun has fired, the athlete has false started. Wikipedia. I am eight years old. Dad is walking me to a friend's house. I tell him, I don't need you to do this for me. Looking back, it must be hurtful to hear such a verbal confirmation that I'm more my mother's son. Dad asks, if someone came after you, what would you do? I'd run. He then points to the park two blocks away. If you can beat me to that tree in the middle of the park, then you're old enough to walk by yourself. I accept the challenge. I mean, I almost tagged Patrick and tag last week and he's the fastest kid in school. I got this, dad said go and no lies. Y'all would've been proud of me. I was fucking gone. I'm up the first block already. Ain't even gonna look back. I know I'm good. It isn't until I get to the second block that I hear a something in the distance. It sounds like thunder, but there's no clouds. I realize it's not coming from above, but from behind me. I turn around, see my father, and feel the fear of God being put in me, realizing this is the first time I've ever seen this man run before. His form was 1936, Jesse Owens, Summer Olympics, perfect. Mind you, at eight years old, I have no idea who Barry Jesse Owens is, but I now know, having seen this man, Barry Allen towards me. I don't know why, but I'm still thinking I got a chance. I can see the tree. I have to be at least halfway. As soon as I turn my head forward again, I feel the ground shake. I look to my left. Dad was already beside me. He ain't even breathing heavy. You think the worst part of this story is that my father doesn't even acknowledge me as he passed me by, but it isn't. The worst part is that all I see now is him in front of me in a hot salmon pink colored button up blowing in the wind beige shorts, high socks, and flip-flops. The man smoked me and flip-flops, fucking flip-flops. When I finally make it to the tree, he doesn't smile or say anything. Just walks beside me as if nothing happened. And for the rest of the way, I'm hoping that he doesn't tell mom about this. <sighs> A crushing thing to a child's ego when a 40-year-old man beats him in a foot race, but you know, lesson learned. Fucking flip-flops. I, 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 I hate flip-flops to this day because of that. Fuck flip-flops. Just want to say that. All right, next poem. This is titled, uh, Such is Genetics. Every so often, mom stops what she's doing, takes a look at me and says, you look like your daddy in a manner that's playful, but with a hint of hurt, as if acknowledging an unspoken betrayal of terms I was never privy to, is like we're on opposite sides of a two-way mirror. I see a reflection of my own in her face staring back at me, but she's on the other side, staring at me and seeing my father. She'll either scrunch her face while pursing her lips in a, ain't this some shit, manner, or, reflect back to when I was a baby and remind me yet again of my first word while thinking aloud, you know, you give them life. You bring them into this world, feed them, watch over them, bathe them, burp them. And what's the first word out of their mouth? Daddy. Then, like a broken clock about to be right for the second time in a day, mom sighs her signature sigh, <sighs> shakes her head and says in a playfully defeated manner, such is life. Oh yeah, we're getting into the family stuff now. Is it getting deeper? Oh, let's see and find out. Who knows? Stay tuned, won't you? This poem's titled Gallows Humor. All the honors go to the tragedy for chewing up the scene while the comedian, who has to be much more subtle to be funny, is just loudly criticized when he doesn't come through. From Edmund Gwen. Funny thing about death. Just before his own, Edmund Gwen said, dying is easy. 
comedy is hard. Funny thing about dying hours before my mother became past tense, she said, when I go, don't bring me back. And I replied, given the weight of the current situation, that's probably the most gangster shit you ever said to me. Funny thing about her last words, she made a joke right before saying them. And I wasn't there to hear it. Ooh, you feel that pause in the air? What? Yeah, controlling a room when he's the only person in a room. Ha <laughs> ha, quarantine, baby. Uh, this poem is called Ocelus. <laughs> Ocelus. The eyes on a peacock's tail feather are called an ocelus. I know that peacocks have a huge need for companionship. Alone, they get heartbroken. I am alone now. I doubt I am a peacock. I mean, I doubt that I am a heart broken. Oh yeah, short poems too. What, what can't he do? Deal with my emotions apparently. <laughs> That's why there's a book for it that you can get uh, for $5 off if you use the QT5 code yes what he's getting better at marketing and things what all right we'll just mosey on it's so with it's so weird now to like do this in a room or whatever and like usually time flies by i have a stopwatch i'm like ah all right maybe i'm going a little too fast let's throw some let's throw some friendly banter in there hopefully people are laughing at the other side of this if they're not we'll get to the poem you can tell me later when we're all free again all right we'll get to this poem that's a favorite of mine i mean they're all favorites of mine. They are. All right, this poem is titled uh, The 4C Complex. The hedgehog's dilemma is a metaphor about the challenges of human intimacy. It describes a situation in which a group of hedgehogs seek to move close to one another to share heat during cold weather. They must remain apart, however, as they cannot avoid hurting one another with their sharp spines. Though they all share the intention of a close reciprocal relationship, this may not occur for reasons they cannot avoid. The black girl dilemma, or sometimes the type 3A through 4C kinky hair dilemma is an example about the challenges of white folks touching a black woman's hair without permission. It describes a situation in which a group of Caucasians or strangers seek to satisfy the curiosity about said black girl without awareness or consideration for said black girl's feelings, existence, or well-being. Though, like, though the Caucasian will perform a dance of words to say that their intentions are well-meaning, they cannot avoid the inevitable offending of the black girl. Though they mean well, making contact with a black girl's hair, however, will not occur for reasons they both cannot avoid. Now, there's no term to explain the occurrence of when a black girl and a black boy explore one another's hair, but I came close to defining it in the bar in Brooklyn when I had been black boy sitting with black girl, the both of us attempting to water to wide ourselves from strangers to friends. And what better way than a decision to navigate her fingers through the soft of my forest? Notice her mouth reveal a crescent moon when she sees her fingers disappear into my midnight. I raise my hand, stop, then ask, may I touch your hair? She replies, yes, you may. I feel there's something more to be said when a black woman gives you permission to touch her hair. No, art, no, God. And how do you describe this texture of God, this chorus of course, a thick quilted hymn? When a black woman gives you permission to touch her hair, it's a front row seat to so much sky, a crown of clouds that look like a succulent, no, a weeping willow, mm, or maybe a heart shaped in, to bloom in full. I don't have the words, just to calm a trust running my fingers around the summit of her hair for us. We're exploring each other's altars, but I imagine to onlookers, the both of us, hair thick as quills, must look like two hedgehogs admiring each other's spines. Do you get it? Because if you look at my hair, it's kind of wet now because I was down for this, but like usually it like, looks like a hedgehog, like Sonic kind of running, blazing through. What? Levels. All right, let me tell you, let me tell y'all. Quick little story. 
about the blackest night of my life. I don't why. Uh, being in a chair, man, feel uh, so restricting, so restricting. But for y'all, we're here for y'all doing this. All of us here for you. Rachel, Sabrina, Adam Parker. Oh, what? We're all here for you, giving you poems. So we'll we'll push through this. Oh, how we will push through this. Now I will tell you a story of the blackest night of my life. The blackest night of my life was a Friday night on Frederick Douglass Boulevard in Harlem, sitting in a restaurant, enjoying the company of a macaroni and cheese filled skillet that accompanies my first taste of catfish and grits as Tupac's ambitions as a writer baptizes the room and the parties where it be so packed. The most African-American night of my life was my first time in South Africa, standing in a room full of countrymen singing songs of their nation word for word by heart as I just stood there, listening to my lover sing with her countrymen, I'm here in the moment, not alone, but alone, ashamed. The songs I know adhere to a different flag, American boy, stranger in a land he should call home, foreigner in a land that's for his own, but not his own, where the atmosphere be so black. In case you haven't noticed, yes, we've reached the black portion of the set. You knew it was coming and you're glad that it's here. Ha ha, ha 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 But in 2020, motherfuckers. Uh, here's a poem called Pretty Women Love Puns. What rapper was this a homage to? Ha uh ha. -huh. Type it in the chat. So uh, Pretty Women Love Puns, scientific fact. During brunch with the woman I love more than my own life and the siblings she protect with all of her own, she has taken a picture of all of us, herself included, and dubbed it the Breakfast Club. Where that would be enough for most, my love is not most. And an Instagram caption must be more than enough in order to do the most for the moment at hand. She comes up with punny brunch names for everyone, but is stuck on the coup de gras for her own. I assess the situation. She's wearing purple, which reminds me that she likes grapes which makes me think of John Steinbeck's book. I ask if she likes crepes. Of course she does. And then it hits me. I lean back in my chair, thanking the heaven above for this blessing as an, oh, holy spirit, it's way out of me. She knows I got something good. You're gonna wanna marry me for this. And she replies, I already do. Tell me, I stare at her face lovingly. Then matter of factly, Crepes of wrath. <laughs> Motherfucker, I'm a goddamn genius. Her jaw, a withdrawn drawbridge from amazement. I, knowing full well this is by far the best pun I'll ever make. Smug as I've ever been. With arms spread eagle, ask repeatedly, how much do you love me right now? The words rush out of her mouth as a welcoming party of affirmation. As she hits post, turns to me. Shows a pearl throne rune smile and says, I'd marry you on the spot. Learn how to do puns. Oh my God, the versatility of it all. Where will he go next? Colonization, that's where we go next, which is also the title of this poem. She asks about my day. I tell her how a mosquito broke in while I was working, made itself an intruder before I made it a mural on the wall. She questions why I decided to kill it. I answer. She asks, have you heard Aziza Bond's poem about killing a centipede? I thought a colonizer's thought, not I'm sorry, or I shouldn't have killed it, but if I don't kill it now, how will I find it again? Aziza Bond's got bars. Her accent has this air of royalty that always escorts the point she's making. I stare at her matter-of-factly, then lovingly, Later that night, after our mouths have said all they could and our bodies speak for themselves, I head towards the kitchen, turn on a light, and see that a roach has infiltrated our Airbnb. I hear the royalty of her accent turn an uncivil sour as she calls me by my surname and shouts, Holman, kill it! Timberland boot in hand, I'm about to rain down the queen's justice upon the intruder, then mid-swing I stop, stare at her lovingly, 
Then matter of factly, and I ask, but isn't this the colonizer's thought? To which she replies, no, that roach is the colonizer and it must be stopped. Oh, mosing our way down here. Boom, 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 boom. Back on track. Back on track. Oh, we got five minutes left. You know, we can fit some more, fit some more poems in here. Uh, let's go with this one from page 78. This is called, not the poem. I can't read my own handwriting. That is the page 70. All right. This is called, not the poem I was going for. All right. A spade, stay a spade. Let's call a spade a spade, not a gardening tool, refers to calling something as it is, speaking bluntly without beating around the bush. For example, a black boy, one strike, a queer black man, two strikes, a queer black woman, three strikes, an unarmed black man, threat, an unarmed black woman, disposable, an unarmed black child, armed and dangerous, a well-dressed black woman, unsafe, a well-spoken black man, not safe, a well-mannered black child, still not safe, an angry black man, unjustified, an angry black woman, unstable, an angry black child, unruly, a black girl, too much, a black woman, not enough, a trans black woman, less, a black person, to set up in a joke, a black culture, to delivery of a joke, a black life, a punchline. That's never not funny. He just lets it sit in the air like that. Oh my God. Uh. These are things I say in my own head to myself. And then I say it out loud and it sounds fucking brilliant. That's from a TV show. Put it in the chat if you know which show. Uh, I think I got time for maybe two or three more and then we'll pass the mic uh, while helping my nephew assemble an ice cream parlor and construction site for his toy city. Everything is all good playing with my nephew as he built his toy city until he said, Noah, now let's do the police department, me. Yeah, I don't really fuck with the police. So mm, I'm gonna have to tap out on this one. What follows is a series of grunting noises that he's now adopted from me. When this occurred, I have no clue, but I'll translate for you guys. Noah, uh, translation, help me. Me, uh, please been fucking up, my guy. I'm just, I can't. Noah, uh, translation, my niggas, I'm six. You're really about to die on this hill with a six-year-old trying to build an entire toy city? This is what happens? This is what happens? This is what you're doing right now? We can do police reform and dismantle this systemic oppression in the marginalized neighborhoods afterwards, but shit, can you help me out here? The parts to snap in for this building are hard and my fingers are fucking tiny, guys. Shit, come on, man. Me. Noah. Me. So the helicopter pad sticker goes on top of the police precinct. <laughs> He's a cute boy. Oh uh, yeah, let's do these final two. Uh, I'll do these last two poems, then we're gonna pass it off. Uh, let's get this poem that is about my wife, who is not the woman <laughs> that buried me in these poems. <laughs> Shout out to my wife, Natasha, saying, yeah, yeah, do these poems about your exes and get paid, whatever. <laughs> the next book better have mad poems about me. Uh, and it will, and it will. Also, shout out to Big Mike, Mike Bertram. He knows why. Uh, here we go. For those who need both hands to lift Milnir. Milnir is uh, Thor's hammer, for those that are not seeing Avengers or know their Norse mythology. My father's basement is a graveyard to everything I was. I'll say it plainly. Everything in dad's basement is filled with mom's share of memories. I can't decide if all the artifacts make up a treasure chest or a mausoleum. Regardless, Tasha and I, archaeology through the pieces that made up my hole before they became parts of a whole. I'll say it plainly. I kept holding on to all the pieces of mom. Now it's time to see what keepsakes I'll keep because I keep everything well kept inside, but physically, I can't keep everything unkept as everything I've kept bottled isn't keeping well. The irony is lost on me that I'm dishing this out of me as I'm unboxing dishes until I spot a jewel at the bottom of the box. This forgotten relic of my mother thawed out of time, her cast iron skillet. Tasha's Australian Indian, 
meaning our culture gap is two oceans thick, I explain how a cast iron skillet is the staple of every black household. Sometimes you don't even know how there's one in the house. It just appears one day and you accept it. Instantly, I remember mom cooking, lifting the skillet from the stove with one hand. Well, I need two just to hold it. Wonder if my negligence made it heavier as the rust has spread thick as the cancer that took its previous chef's life. But Tasha believes the relic's still salvageable. When we get home, she turns my sister's kitchen counter into an operating table. Lady Macbeth's the spot of corrosion with steel wool before baptizing the skillet in the sink. Every time she pulls it up from the water, she inspects it as if looking for a pulse of a memory while my sister and I watch from the doorway, both too afraid of what this resurrection may unbox from us. But Tasha, Tasha can't let dead things lie. For two nights in a row, she oils the pan and heats it in the oven. On the third night, she calls me into the kitchen saying, it's done. She hands the skillet over while smiling before telling me, I hope you know this is mine now. And I'm about to argue that this iron is my birthright, but I don't because I see how many hands she needs to lift it. She only needed one, I'm still getting my weight up. Whatever, don't judge me. Uh, I guess I'll do this one. Last poem, hopefully, I'm at the 20 mark, but I'll, just, I'll just do this, I'll do this last one to close out the set and make a full circle. And we can go to our next poet, which is Rachel Wiley. Yeah. All right, this poem is called Proffer. How's it gonna come full circle? Oh, you'll fucking see, I'm a writer. Proffer. In track, when running a relay event, the best way to receive a baton pass is to judge the distance of the incoming teammate when they're close enough, the receiver, when they're close enough, the receiver will turn away and sprint forward. The pass may shout an audible call such as up or here, here, here to let the receiver know that they're within passing range. The receiver will then throw an arm back outstretched and high palm underhand facing the passer. When the receiver feels the baton within their grasp, they will grip the baton and pull it forward into the stride. The passer will let go of the baton slightly before the receiver's pull. This must all be done within the relay zone marked by a row of yellow triangles on the track 20 meters apart. If the pass is not received within the zone, the team is disqualified. If the baton is dropped at any point, the team is disqualified. This event is where the idiom to pass the baton stems from, meaning to pass the job or responsibility onto someone. It's a gesture that's more crucial than simple. It depends on both teammates like marriage. My sister told me of a time when she saw my father, who was then her stepfather, and mom, who was our mother, exchanging pet names with one another in the kitchen. Fondness, grandfather clocking between the two, back and forth. I only know time for when their pendulum stopped and all I ever saw was them exchange distance. When I was in track and field, I did the four by 400 meter relay. I always ran final position of the relay team, the anchor leg. The anchor leg is responsible for either making up lost ground on the race leader or preserving the lead. I never had to make up lost ground. A few weeks after the funeral, my father calls, asks if I enrolled in something about a 401k, already knowing I haven't. He's frustrated, but I think not really at me. So I ask, why are you so adamant about this? Because I want to go to sleep and your mother won't let me. She keeps coming into my dreams, telling me to make sure you're all right. I just wanna get some sleep. I give the old man some clarity by reminding him that he and mom hated talking to each other. I assure him it's just in his head. Dad says, we still call each other back and forth. Each time we did, we talked about you. When we hang up, I do what my father asks of me. Then imagine mom visiting dad that night for the last time back in that same kitchen walking 20 meters toward him, casually tossing the baton while saying, here, your turn. Thank y'all for having me. Let's bring on Rachel Worley.
and we'll go back on. Thank you so much, everyone. Give it up one more time for Omar. For those of you who have just joined, my name is Tanisha Nicole and I'm your host this evening. Uh, Omar has just kicked off our live stream with an amazing set. He also mentioned this exclusive discount that we are running just for you viewers tonight. Using the code QT5 spelled out F-I-V-E, you can get $5 off of your pre-order of Omar's book. More on that can be found here in the chat. Now on deck, we have Adam and Sabrina, but our next artist is Rachel Wiley. Rachel Wiley is a performer, poet, feminist, and fat positive activist from Columbus, Ohio. Her work has appeared on Upworthy, The Huffington Post, The Militant Baker, and Everyday Feminism. Rachel is the author of Nothing Is Okay and has a forthcoming re-release of her first collection, Fat Girl Finishing School, also available for pre-order today. Everyone, please help me in welcoming Rachel Wiley to the mic. Hi, everybody. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> I want to start out by look, look at my kids together. I'm so cute. This is the re-release of Fat Girl Finishing School. I'm going to read from it first. Um, yeah. Uh, I just want to say what's up. Thanks for joining us on this Saturday in quarantine. Uh, I put on lipstick just for all of you. Um, let's see. See. We'll get it kicked off. Actually, I want to kick off with an uh, with a haiku in the new manuscript. I'm gonna go all over the place because uh, I can. Um, it's called "Tattoo This Haiku on Your Back Fat So the Haters Can Read It As You Walk Past Them Into the Future." After Neil Hillborn. I saw the future. I did, and in it. I'm alive and still fat. Word. Don't get it twisted. Um, <laughs> let's see. Ode to Tracy Turnblad. Ode to my first fat role model. Fat rolled model, patron saint of fat girl rebellion. Ode to swinging hips wide while doing the Watusi being both the fat friend and the love interest, kissing the cute boy on screen without an ounce of unworth. Ode to your chubby hands and their tape. Ode to your deserving, your unsettling, your twist and shout trailblazing. Ode to taking the mean girl's lunch and her boyfriend and still having time to spray your hair high and fight. Ode to that dress in the last scene of the film the pink silk sheath of defiance with a train. Ode to your royal drag queen mother for turning arched eyebrow into bar raised, for stuffing all of her decadent orbit into those pencil skirts. Ode to my own mother for gifting you to me, a VHS hymnal when I was just eight years old and so chubby and learning how to pray in my very own temple. Boop, boop, boop. Um, for you youngsters or non-knowers, Tracy Turnblad is the lead character in Hairspray. Um, I am talking about the OG Hairspray with Ricky Lake. Um, even though she's a mess now, uh, she was a really important character. Shout out to anybody raised on John Waters film. Um, it's a small grouping of us and we're weird, but it's fine. It's totally fine. Quarter. In Texas, there is a woman who let despair eat her whole house, built a mausoleum of dime store romance novels on her late husband's side of the bed, the bed they shared for over 30 years. The mausoleum had to be dismantled by strangers with snow shovels after the neighbors complained about the strong stench of sorrow wafting from the house on a high wind and the way it lowered their property value. 
wondering how she could let it get so bad. The window stands on her porch, the widow, sorry, the widow stands on her porch in a daze, wearing an apologetic smile as dumpster after dumpster is filled with her bone marrow and hauled away. Halfway through the cleanup, under a stack of paperback harlot heaving bosoms, they find a mummified copperhead snake frozen mid-strike. The widow's until then estranged daughter holds it out in quaking hands, says, Mom, do you understand that this could have killed you? The widow only nods and smiles, her eyes spilling over with, if only, she is long gone. They don't notice our death sometimes until we have all but burst at the seams, until we are a neighborhood blight, an impending foreclosure, a bloated corpse. Oh, it's gonna be that kind of night, y'all. I'm going through it these days in my feelings. Quarantine doesn't help. I'm just bottled up. Uh, like my apartment is just full of feelings and it just keeps shaking up. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm ready to, to pop a little bit. Uh, I live alone except for the cat. So um, let's see, where are we on time? I'm sure I haven't gone that long yet. Not at all, okay. This is an oldie. I mean, all these are oldies because it's from Fat Girl Finishing School, which uh, was originally pub published by Timber Mouse in 2014. Um, but Button was kind enough to scoop it back up, give her some larger font, give her, oh, I did write a whole forward um, or a preface, whatever. Um, so that's fun, right? <laughs> A poem for Amy Winehouse. I listened to this podcast called All Fantasy Everything, and it's seriously hilarious. Like, all these comedians, they're dudes, whatever. I don't usually give dudes much airtime, but uh, they remind me of the guys I hung out with in high school. Um, like, I hung out with this group of boys, and we would just be obnoxious with each other um, in my friend Robbie's basement, which we called the Boom Boom Room, because it's where he kept his drums. <laughs> um, but we would hang out down there. Um, and just talk endless uh, shit and just, oh, I don't know if we're supposed to swear, but I'm doing it. Um, we would just talk like endless crap. Anyway, I don't know how I got there. Uh, the cat also might walk in front of the camera right this minute. So I'm trying. There she goes. This is me out there, y'all. And there she goes. Poem for Amy Winehouse. Anyway, they were talking on the podcast about celebrity death that really messed them up and uh Amy Winehouse was one that really messed me up um just at a certain time in my life uh a poem for Amy Winehouse I could never do what you did girl could never sing girl like swallowed sidewalks and iron gates their jagged edges dragging down the soft faces in hopes of coughing up some Billy Holiday soul ended up instead with blood and spit in my hands. Could never bead string notes from the gravel in my palms, girl, not like you, never so blue, girl, never so black and blue, girl, not like you. They'll say they saw you going. They never saw you coming. When that hummingbird moved into your heart, it was, be it was because you were holding nectar, girl. Sweet, slow, soul-dripping nectar from your chest, girl. Your throat shouldn't have to know how to sing whiskey like that, girl. Record needle between the toes like you, girl. Your grooves, they fit me, girl. They swung me, girl. Bloomed orchids in my lungs, girl. Your ribs whining cemetery gates, howling ghosts and singing shovels. Girl, they'll say they saw you going. I could never do that thing you did, girl, never reach with my vocal cords, tentacle grasping at the air for busted heart understanding, just for a pause, girl. For you are pretty, girl, for you are enough, girl, for someone to hold you in place from dissolving, girl. Never so much broken glass in the hinge of my jaw, girl, not like you, girl. Girl, they'll say they saw you going. 
I'm sorry your nets only pulled in dead fish with flashbulb eyes to take pictures of your failings, girl, to photograph your razor blade collarbones, to zoom in on the tube tracks in your arms. I'm sorry they made you a silent film with separate soundtrack, girl. Girl, they're all saying they saw you going, saw you going so blue, girl, so very, very blue, girl. I could never sing like you, girl. And I never did see you going. Um, I don't know, drugs are bad, I guess, some of them, not all of them, but you know, the ones that killed Amy Winehouse, not my faves. Also heartbreak, also, I don't know, putting our worth in weird places. I don't know, there's a lot to unpack there, but we won't. I only have like 15 more minutes or something. I don't know how time, I don't know how time works. In which the poet learns to wake up alone. Also, slightly named after an Amy Winehouse song. Uh, she was really big for me. If you insist on dwelling in this notion that your love did go away, because they could no longer endure the heft of you. I say then, let them go. You may mourn them and all of the things dreamed but left unplucked between you. You may cry and rock and drink and fuck some stranger every time you forget or better still every time you remember the way their hands pulled at you without regret or judgment or even fear the way they perhaps coaxed from you some luxurious bravery to look yourself full naked in the mirror and smile at the heart it contained and the lust it released and the wild unabashed melting of all of your body into all of theirs. You may, you may mourn all of this, but you may not now, you may not ever stare contemptuous into your soft hips your rounded stomach, all of your heavy and uneven parts as though they are a collection of children who would not behave well enough to make your love stay. You may not punish your skin with untouching. There should be no mournful candle lighting, no forgiveness ritual. Your hips are not some obstacle to overcome. Your rippled and stretched skin are not an off key choir just to be endured. Take note from your thighs and the way they embrace like unshamed lovers in a world so scared of touching. You hold so much warmth in you that you must only be a holiday. And there is no penance, none whatsoever for you to pay for that. So that's what I read out of this uh, re-released version of Fat Girl Fitness and Finishing School, which you can pre-order, um, which I believe the $5 off code will work, but you can't have anything else in your, uh, in your cart, I think. Yeah, because they ship differently, but you can use the code multiple times on multiple orders. That is my understanding. If you have other questions, I don't know, I have to click the button. I'm sure they would be happy to tell you. Let's lighten it up a little bit. Oh, if we were supposed to be clean, I guess this is out the window. Word. Um, an incomplete Pinterest board of uses for the abundance of condoms that expired after he left. <laughs> this was written uh, when I was still dating dudes. So like, that's a thing. Um, <laughs> it doesn't have me anymore. Um, An incomplete Pinterest board of uses for the abundance of condoms that expired after he left. Dish mittens, like dish gloves, except not. Learn to make balloon animals for the neighborhood kids. Donate them to an up and coming drug cartel for filling with heroin and transporting. Anybody watching Ozark? That show is good. Rain boots for the cat. The cat gave me a fucked up look on that one. Throw them into a bowl of not yet expired condoms and play a fun home game of condom roulette, AKA whoopsie baby. 
fill them up with your spinster tears and throw them at happy couples. Use them as covers for bananas, zucchini, cucumbers, and other oblong fruits and vegetables. Cut them lengthwise, dry them in the sun, and sew them together to make a protective, ultra protective sofa cover that's ribbed for her pleasure. Sell them on Etsy as infinity change purses, sleeping bags for caterpillars. It gets cold, it gets cold out there, that's what I'm saying. Just write new dates on them and uh, hope for the best. Draw faces on them and use them as finger puppets to reenact all the moments that went wrong in your last relationship and then Snapchat those to your ex. Keep rolled up copies of all of your inevitable restraining orders safe and dry within them. Woo, 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 woo. That's what McKibbins likes to do. I think she's out there. Hi, I love you. Um, I did a very sad woo, 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 woo. Mother's Day is coming up. I don't have nice poems about my mom, as I might read in a minute. But <laughs> I, have, I have a Mother's Day poem called Ode to All the Mothers I Borrowed. There were years I spent wandering the west side of Columbus, a shark, a sharp tongued girl in too much eyeliner and flannel shirts from the men's section that were only outsized by my too many and messy feelings. Your children brought me to your doorstep, a found and muddy thing. And you made space for me in your homes, at your tables, in your plans, me with swear words stuck between my teeth me feral and always ready for a fight, me chipped nail polish and crying in your bathroom. You returned me to my own home as late as you could because you caught the confessions I draped in crash jokes. You saw the unmothering in my fingernails chewed to the quick. Oh, what a ghost town I would have been without you. What a collection of unfocused photographs. What a loss. Shout out to all my friends, mamas in high school uh, who held me down. Um, Cause uh, they were the real ones. And I had a really great theater teacher too. Um, let's do some new shit off my phone. Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay. Um, Let's see, I already read the haiku. This one's called Red Herring. For months, I held it in my mouth. Word made of glass, my ex. I was sure it would ribbon my tongue with its wrongness. When I finally force it past my lips, it leaves a dull metallic taste. And while it is unpleasant, it is ultimately harmless, or at least more harmless than you saying you never loved me. If untruth could cut, your mouth would have filled with blood for that one. Your tongue flopped onto the sofa cushion between us, a gasping fish. Um, blah, blah, blah. These are all long and not quite uh, edited the way I want it just yet. Break up with your mother. I'm scarred. See what I did there? The Ariana Grande title, but fucked it up and flipped it around in layers. After all of her lessons in strength, wherein she would slink behind me and snatch a vertebrae from my unsuspecting spine and then dare me not to collapse while she mocked my weaving, while she dodged my arms reaching for motherly, motherly tent steadying. I think the edible's starting to kick in. <laughs> while she dodged my arms reaching for motherly steadying, I truly believed she would be proud when I began learning to write myself pressing my back to walls whenever I moved between rooms. 
I'd be a liar if I told you my little girl heart hadn't spent a fortune in waxy birthday wishes on hopes of thrilling my mother with the way I could magic myself more and still upright after each severing. Instead, it seems I have embarrassed her. She never meant for me to have it better than she did. She saw my magic before I ever did and feared it enough to try to snuff it out. She never intended strength. Oh, the audacity of me to go on and gift it to myself. You know, if you have a good mom, uh, tell her happy Mother's Day. <laughs> if not, there's got to be somebody in your life. Um, the cat is really trying to get back here, yeah. Um, she's a mess. Uh, I think I still have a couple more to go. I'll do like two, maybe three more. Um, so some of you have seen the poem, um, A Letter to My Cat, um, about my impending spinsterhood um, that I wrote after Andrew Ginson. Um, that was a poem. <laughs> for my old cat Clementine um, who passed away a couple years ago um, and this is a poem I wrote about that it's called dreadful sorry Clementine for my dear departed familiar September showed up on time but summer refused to give up its seat the first Saturday morning without you in 12 years a sweating man brought me a wooden box of ashes bearing your name etched in gold. The cicadas started to creep into the house between the gaps of the window screens without you here to kill them and leave their headless bodies at the top of the stairs for me an offering. For your home going, I trapped and trained a choir of the otherworldly insects to sing Queen's fat bottom girls in tribute to your well-fed memory. And then I gathered up all the neighborhood squirrels who relinquished the tips of their tails to your teeth and got them to march across the roof, a procession of furry flags flying half mast. I put on a black dress and rolled on the carpet still covered in your loose floor, is in your loose fur, as I could not bring myself to give it up to the vacuum's greedy mouth. The longest you ever let me hold you in all of our time together was that final day in the vet's small office. I begged your gold sedated eyes to forgive me that I could not stay to witness you to the very last heartbeat. They told me a wretched dampness had gathered in your lungs, an underhanded flash flood that swept you away. I'm so sorry I didn't see it coming. I would have fought it back with my own fists and all of my magic if I had. Sadness. Um, okay, I'll do heavy and then one more. Am I good on time? Somebody pop up in the chat and tell me otherwise. Um, heavy. If it's too personal, he says, you can tell me to shut up. But have you always been heavy? I smile at his question the way I often do when someone tiptoes around the word fat like it's bones. Ah, I'm slipping, sorry. No. Sorry, technical difficulties. <laughs> I'm back. Uh, I smile at his question the way I often do when someone tiptoes around the word fat, like its bones are made of damp packed sugar. His avoidance a reminder that once I also refused to say this word for fear of making it too real, too permanent, an incantation of shame. The man asking this question is in my water aerobics class at the YMCA. I miss that class. Every Monday and Wednesday, we meet here to lunge and jump and kick against the water's embrace, tantruming our bodies against it in the name of exercise. 
He asks this question with his eyes fixed on a man two lanes over, standing on the lip of a pool, of the pool, a well-oiled wind-up toy of muscle and sinew preparing to dive. My, part, my workout partner says he used to have a body like that and watches the swimmer like the arrival of a lover finally home from a long war who walked right past him and into the arms of another. I don't know this particular longing. I have been fat nearly my entire life, buoyant, though not a terribly strong swimmer. I have longed for many people from this body, none of them a previous smaller version of me. I've stared at smaller bodies, wondering what it might feel like to move through the world, not so much like a steamship in a hostile canal, but I always return to my substantial and loyal body and the cargo of necessary it hauls. All right, one more, and then uh, we'll pass the mic, I think, is Adam next. If I'm wrong, my bad. Uh, if I'm wrong, surprise, bitches. <laughs> I want to thank you all again for joining us this evening for this hot fire. Um, it gave me a reason to, like, I don't know, get up out of bed and uh, do things. Here we go. This last one is tentatively titled Terms and Conditions. It's still in the editing mode, but I, I feel it right now, and I want to share it with you. Listen, if you aren't trying to love me well into the final devastation, please grant me the mercy of never breathing the words hot into my neck. Be a lustful month of limbs braided to mine if you must, but leave before your sweat can dry on my skin, before the scent of you can rouse my hungry heart. My love is the feral child who cannot be rocked back to sleep with any amount of ease. The next one to love me cannot be a false prophet. The next one I love cannot be a hopeful coward. The next one will have to come in while my house is a collection of misfortune. Fall in love with the broken wings of my end of day eyeliner. And then with the furious chaos of my pillow lathered hair at the start of the next day. They'll need to show up during the unbreathing of a panic attack. Show up on the worst day of my entire life and then keep showing up. You need to love with me so concretely that our sabotaging hands can never pick loose the knots. Love with me so staunchly that after the final trumpet blast of this life sounds, if there is anything left to be found, it should be our still smoldering bones knit together, our teeth upset into one another's gaping tongueless mouths, our flesh and fat cooked down into a married oil slick sieved through our overlapping rib cages and soaking into the dirt underneath what once was and will forever be us. Two people who can never be separated, a rich soil for whatever will grow in the new world. And in the meantime, in the stretch before the end, however far off it may or may not be, I would like it very much if we could spend some time taking for granted the sour coffee breath meeting of our mouths at the start of the day and grow accustomed to the mindless drifting and holding of one another's precious hands. Let us fight and forgive and know the only end for us is the same one that ends the world. Thanks, guys. That's my time.
Thank you very much, Rachel. Uh, as you can see, everyone on the bottom of the screen is our virtual tip jar uh, via PayPal. So definitely be sure to go and tip and support your features. Um, we're already seeing so many amazing orders coming in for those pre-orders on those books using that uh, special discount code of QT5. So definitely please keep sending your love always, you know, going back into the arts and supporting art form. Um, again, there at the bottom underneath Adam's wonderful photo is the PayPal link for any and all virtual tips that will be uh, given to our artists. And uh, next up, we're going to bring Adam. Dr. Adam Faulkner is a poet, educator, and arts and cultural strategist. He's the author of The Willies, which was published in February of this year from Button, as well as the 2017 collection Adoption. Uh, his work has appeared in the range of print and various media spaces, including the programming for HBO, NBC, NPR, BET, uh, In the New York Times, and elsewhere. So everybody, please give it up one more time for Adam. Hey, are we good? Audio good? Lighting good? Video good? Hi, everybody. Um, excellent. Thank you, Spencer. Thank you, Tanisha. Whew. Uh, I am ecstatic to be here and excited that out of all the places that y'all could have spent your Saturday uh, quarantined nest time, it's with us. Um, for real, thank you. Thank you, Tanisha. Thank you, Spencer. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Button. And uh, what a joy on a weekend, like like we're all here um, to sit at the feet of uh, Rachel and Sabrina and Omar and, uh, and and listen to your work. I love y'all. Thank you so much for, for sharing. I would was, I was say share the mic, but share the Zoom chat room because y'all are cracking me the fuck up over there. Um, all right. I want to read some poems, some brand new poems and some old poems. And um, you know, good times will be had by all. And I'm also going to sing a little bit because that moves the needle on my mood. And if you need to do whatever you need to do to make you feel a little bit lighter, like I miss the bar chat, I miss the kink clinking glasses of readings, I miss friends chatting in the corner. So like, if you too need to put on like a silk scarf to make yourself feel a little bit more like at home and fly in this moment of quarantine, then I suggest you do that. Put on that red lipstick, Rachel. Um, but I'm, I'm gonna sing, and uh, I hope that's all right. I just wanna pray. And I just wanna pray. Let's get one thing halfway straight. I have spent my entire life trying on costumes because nobody told me I couldn't. And the stakes were never that high, which I have come to think is mostly what makes a white writer a white writer. The last time anyone referred to me by that name was exactly never, but that is also the point. I am a queer poet. I am a child of an addict. I am a masquerading white boy. My best friend died and it was sad. And these are the stories I water in the blue. I'm a camp counselor, test shape, choir boy, cipher rapper, scratch golfer, honor roll, point head, pot guard. And Whitman says, very well, you contain multitudes. But Whitman was a white writer too. And the not so funny thing about spending a life proving you aren't something is that any story you tell that isn't the story is just survival. Or it is more like a brick for laying until the wall is high enough that you are safe inside and you wake up and you say, whoops, whose house is this? Who did I hurt to get here? And is it too late to call for help? All right. Um, yeah, so listen, I'm, I'm gonna read some poems from this brand new beautiful book that button, God bless you, bequeathed me. Um, it's called The Willies, and it's, uh, it's really telling, it's telling two stories, right? It's, um, it's one telling the story of my own sort of like evolution into queerhood. It's also telling the story of my own father's uh, descent into and um, exit from addiction and substance abuse recovery. 
So it's really telling these two sort of like masquerading stories about how we like hide from ourselves and how we run and what the stakes become when we are running from the most urgent and important questions in our lives. So I'm gonna read some of the masquerading poems that detail my dad's sort of life and descent around addiction, but then a lot more around my own sort of like queer narrative and some of that stuff is from the next project too, all right? I'm so used to being like, pop up in the chat and say something, but then, you know, you can't really do that. And that's okay because I love you anyway, because, you know, Omar and Rachel Wiley are texting me right now and that's, I'm getting hot just looking at it. All right. My father is a mansion made entirely of myths. My father is a trophy in a flock of empty frames. He is a fork in the most violent of rivers. He is a detective, a therapist, a sax player, a nobody, a water walker. He is a weaver whose mouth spills stories like moths. He is legend. Both arms around me like a bomb blast storm of a thousand swallowed keys. Candle in a cave without an entrance. His wine glass sloshes into his lap at red lights. He is an empty groove in a mattress. Hard back dickens through drywall. He helps people fish inside themselves for the right lie. He is other women's names and locked cabinets. One eye cast over his shoulder for shrapnel. He is vomit on the bedroom carpet of my childhood home. He is scholar of bomb blast and keys and both arms around me. He is made of myths and keys and red lights and other women. He is a pile of snip strings and snot in a rehab waiting room. He is a hard back water walker. He is a fishing tail. He is a candle. He is an elaborate entrance. Thank you. Um, so the story uh, of my father's sort of like masquerading is around addiction. Mine is around identity in terms of queerness and masculinity. And a lot of the shape that that takes in this book is around race and cultural appropriation. Um, and there's a series I tell in the book about chronicling the, the versions of my white boy dumb or that that I was at through the lens of certain album drops in hip hop. So when the Wu-Tang came out or when Blueprint came out or when all these other layers of costuming uh, Adam um, were, were at work. And this poem is called The Whitest Thing. Owning your own white guilt is not cool yet. So you stuff the soft parts of other kids' cultures into your pockets until you believe that it is not there at all. You are a matching sweatsuit jukebox stocked with everything from Ice Cube to Outkast. Entire albums memorized and coiled in the damp of your throat. They are gunfire into the air above the school parking lot. And that, well, that is as black as you think possible and pulling blunts the size of magic markers into your lungs before school is black. Your dance routines are black. They call you Justin Timberlake. Sharpening your crossover is the blackest, though you are the only white boy on the court anyway. They call you Steve Nash. You used to stare at a freckle on your left hand and imagine the entire pigment of your skin that color, how much more you that actually feels and until someone tells you otherwise that is black too and it isn't that you don't know you're white right i mean less white is all you'd really like to be you're sure there are good parts about having white skin too even if you cannot see them yet because no one asks you where you came from or how you got here which is good because you probably couldn't answer anyhow you just appear with an insatiable hunger to touch things that do not belong to you in a culture that fits like a bedsheet. No one tells you that you can't place your favorite things about black people into a single bucket and just try them on to feel better about something until it's time to come inside for dinner. And so you do just that. You dip your toe in and then out and you run when you must, but you stay when you choose. And that part, well, that is the whitest thing of all.
quarantine pause, as Omar would put it. That really, that gets me because, you know, if, you know, we're, we're, we're performers and attach a, you know, not to really spill the tea, but attach a vague sense of self-worth to like <laughs> you radiating us back to us and the transition of like poet in live room to the Zoom format really sort of like strips clean <laughs> um, the, the, that immediate applause. But I'm so glad that y'all are here and I'm glad that it's Saturday and there's a difference between Saturday and all other days in quarantine. So wherever you are, I hope you're doing something special and beautiful and kind and tender and gentle to yourself. All right. Um, Going to read uh, some pieces that are part of this sort of like newer, newer thing I'm working on. Not to sort of like, you know, show the show the hands too much, but I'm, I'm working on a new project, and it's this book that was utter joy to work on with Button that sort of like kicked off that that project. Um, I'm going to read a couple poems from from that. I think, and yes, you are correct. I do have a post-it note with my set list right here because without that. You know, it's tricky, so stay with me. I crushed on the girls who dated the boys I crushed on, which I understand sounds inefficient, but really it did the job. I loved Jeff, or at least from my desk behind him in third period, I liked imagining my palm slapped around the buzzed cowlick on his neck. And Jeff asked Tasha to a dance, which I knew to mean that Tasha and I should hook up. It is not that complicated if you really think about it. I mean, I loved Evan or the way that pool water clung to his trunks and his thigh hairs when he climbed out of the chlorine and he got head from Michelle Cantor that summer behind the equipment, equipment shed. So I gave her my virginity. We thrashed around in the dead darkness of a linen closet. Our bones clacked against the hardwood floor until there wasn't much else to say. Here's a newbie. Very new shit. Thank you, Rachel, for reading like brand new stuff. Cause like, you know, if not write, create and share, then why? <laughs> the title of this is Looking for Mask, No Symptoms. Looking for mask, no symptoms. For top, for dom, for head, for now, for right now, looking must travel. Can host, must host, can travel, can't also be sad about someone somewhere else. No hurt, just flesh. Stay home. Hung mask, please don't get me sick. We'll travel. Your handsome cutie, what's up? Hi there, hi here. You smoke, come over. Do you live here where the hurt is or are you just visiting? Please don't bring the sick, the sponge that is the body, the soggy bruise inside. Please ring out before you fuck my mouth, then leave. Must hide, must hurt, just here for fun, just curious, just looking for right now. No symptoms. When I say that he is a good looking man, I mean that entirely objectively. As in anyone who thinks otherwise might be so homophobic that they themselves are gay and I am not gay, therefore I appreciate how other people might be drawn to certain features that he holds. Now, when I say that I find him handsome, again, I would like to clarify that statement if it's okay. I mean, I think of him as beautiful in that girls love him sort of way. How, if I were a girl, I might wait outside his dressing room too. I might write him love letters too, but I'm not, so I won't, but I get it. And even this said aloud in this very Zoom room, I tried to pivot, Zoom room, bar room, Zoom, it didn't work. And even this said aloud in this very room, a flag javelined deeper into the cocksure certainty of my own Budweiser. So straight that is, that I can say I think about his stubble against my neck without your thinking this poem is about to get gay as hell. That glorious scrape and push of dueling jawlines, 
How I spend my morning commute on the two train wondering how our college soccer hips might feel cutting into one another in a corner on the hood of a car in some neighborhood I do not live in where no one knows me outside this splintered park bench and a rolled up jean and a tired black t-shirt this orange magic hour on the lazy East River and a hairy tattooed arm laid lazy around my neck like a hitching post. A giddy ribbon unraveling inside me each time he cups my face in his palms. Sorry, right. y'all know the deal. It's a, 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 a charge in need. All right, a um, couple more quickies, and then uh, I'm really, 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 really excited to. Uh, to hear Sabrina read. Omar, you're a genius. Uh, you, you, your ability to just turn on a dime and force all of the things that we've invested laughter and humor in um, to like a connectivity with ourselves is incredible. And Rachel, you are a tour de force. What a joy to be here with you. Um, all right, three more quickies, here we go. Pivot. I'm gonna read. Um, I'm gonna read a poem I never ever read, and then two brand new ones. This is a poem uh, called "As Long as You're Out," and if you're uh, if you don't have the book, you know, shameless self plug. Buy this book. It's an outstanding read, and you should also buy everybody's book who's reading here tonight. But like, you know, should go without saying that when your livelihood is like really rolled back because of uh, you know folks. You know, folks um, canceled tours and canceled bookstore readings. Um, it means a lot that we're here. Um, I forget what discount there is. Oh, QT5. QT5, is that what the discount is? QT5, that's what somebody said. Otherwise, or, or somebody's just saying something to me in the chat and I'm telling it to you, which is why I'm terrible at telephone. But hi, nice to meet you. All right, uh, as long as you're out. This is a poem that at one point I wrote in a deep state of desire that Aubrey Graham was a homosexual. <clears throat> Aubrey Graham, also known as uh, Champagne Poppy, also known as uh, Drake. As long as you're out, honestly, I would prefer white wine if they had it. Plus, an antique cigarette holder with Aubrey etched in the side. This room here is for my elephant, but I am not sure it is big enough. It's imported. As long as you're out, would you bring back a satchel of lambskin or something? I have a lot of feelings and I'd like to stuff them in an expensive place. I'm good for it. Just put me in a chair and raise me up. Make sure we're recording because this year could be a moon landing, could be a world war, could be a global pandemic, a Jurassic Park, might spend it in a Raptors jersey or my house tights, I am not sure yet. Just all out is what I am thinking. So bring me a bucket of Molson Ultras, a tuna sandwich the way my mom likes it, lightly toasted. Bring me a squad of carrier owls to get the word out. Bring me two days stubble on a man with wild eyes. Crack the truffle butter and coat my chest with it. And if you need to ask, go ahead. Head. But as long as you're out, could we touch up the treble on the parts where I'm crying, where I am soft and weepy about that ex I lose sleep over? Are we rolling here? Are the lights on? Let's pay a stunt pilot to throw my name in the clouds. For God's sakes, this the shit I want to come out to. Fill me while I jump into the gust of all this gold. All right. All right, all right. Um, gonna read two uh, last brand new ones and then get out of the way and uh, in enjoy this evening like um, like it's meant to be. Goes without saying, uh, but if you're out there and we're not connected, you know, holler at me. Let's find each other. The socials are uh, easy and available and very, very sustaining and life-giving at a moment when we're like, you know, in our separate quarantined nests and trying to like remember what community feels like. All right, two last brand new ones. Here we go. Oh, and these are these are from that this new piece, which a couple of the pieces I read tonight are kind of from that. They're like taking on this um, almost sort of like young adult voice, uh, and a lot of them are sung. I'm not going to continue to sing them just because you know there's another time and place for that. And I'm tired now. <laughs> uh, 
And, you know, I am singing very loudly and there are people sharing this drywall next to me. And by people, I mean my mother because I'm staying in my family's house. All right, too much information. Here we go. Cousin Josh was the first gay man I knew who wasn't on TV and really I only heard about him whenever my uncle felt like bringing it up, which was only once he got sick. And even then it was only the movie costumes and the award shows and the beach houses and how much I looked like him, which bugged me because everyone knew he was gay and I wondered if that's what he meant by looked like him. But everyone also knew he was HIV positive. And then he got beat up in Central Park and left home as a teenager to make his own life because my uncle told him to and I wondered if that's what he meant too. I was old enough to drink the first time I finally met him on West 56th Street in Manhattan and still trying to have sex with women. And I remember feeling bad for expecting to meet someone sick because he was so handsome and he was so kind. And I could not even look him in the eyes. Okay, last poem. Um, all of these just kind of don't really have titles, but the titles are the first lines. And um, it's really about, I appreciate the shout out to the Boom Boom Room, Rachel Wiley, OG of all time. Uh, these poems, all many of these poems are about many a Boom Boom Room. But this is about truth or dare, which I always thought was like a lovely and endearing game, but also, kind of a silly game because really who chooses truth the boom boom zoom omar my god see what you're missing in this chat room is like fairly iconic the boom boom zoom welcome here we go Truth or dare is a funny metaphor because honestly who picks truth like really is that even a thing when you are 13 at the swimming pool or in the backseat of Kyle McKinnon's Jeep or in the woods behind your middle school with a group of curious kids and your heart is racing, who in those moments is really like, I challenge you to speak your truth. I insert name formally acknowledge that I am petrified of putting my mouth on another person and in fact have become so preoccupied with not doing sex right that it is borderline paralyzing. Also, my dad drinks too much and I'm a homosexual. No, that is not how this game works. But what if it was? I'm saying what if the gauntlet that we all had to walk through on our path through the wonder years wasn't some thicket of silent swinging boy blades or taunts or dares? What if it was a quiet open field with an outrageous Midwestern sky that stretches blue for miles and miles and miles? And what if the only way to get there is by saying I am scared? Or I am sorry, or I was wrong, or I made a mistake, or I'm feeling a bit alone. Now this is just a thought experiment here, so stay with me, but I'm saying what happens if the only muscle we ever get to build is that one? What type of place is that? I love y'all very, very much. Thank you for spending time with us. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Tanisha. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Omar. Sabrina, let's get it. Wow, that was amazing. Everyone give it up one more time for Adam. I've seen you all in the chat, seemed really, really engaging. Um, and I am so, so excited to have our next and final performer with us uh, rounding out tonight. This evening is going to be Sabrina. Um, Sabrina Benheim is a writer, performance and teaching artist whose home base is in Toronto. She's represented Toronto in multiple international competitions, including being a member of the championship winning 2014 Toronto Poetry Slam scene team. And Sabrina is the author of Depression and Other Magic Tricks, which you can see here up on the screen. And she has written for e 
ESPNW, the Government of Canada, among other avenues. So everyone, please virtually help me welcome Sabrina to the mic. Okay, I'm done. I'm done. Thank you all. Uh, Beyonce blessed us with a remix during quarantine, so I had to shout that out. Um, okay, how are you all? Happy Saturday. What a nice night. Um, I'm really loving sharing this Zoom room. Boom Zoom, I don't even know what it's called anymore, um, with all these lovely, lovely people um, and poets that I have watched since before I started doing poetry and I'm like truly honored to be here um, in this virtual room. So yeah, I'm just gonna jump into some poems. I hope it's okay that I'm gonna do mostly new poems because my book came out three years ago and uh, that's a long time ago to do the same poem. So I'm gonna do some of them, but I'm just saying that uh, yeah, I really hope that you buy their books tonight with the QT5 code. Um, Rachel has two books you could buy. Adam and Omar both have wonderful books. I think Omar, you can like pre-order. I don't know how it works. I think that's how it works. But yeah, buy their books, absolutely. And um, here's some new poems. Uh, I never write angry poems, so here's an angry poem. It's called, in the text message, I think, well, the man I think I am in love with says to me, it's just that in my head, you are not a real person. And just like that, poof, I guess I am a ghost. A ghost you begged for a haunting once, but you know what, maybe some other time. Ha, huh. time is not real. I mean, I am more real than time and you are cruel. A cr good kiss goodbye and I must be a spell. Like the notes of a piano when you finger the right keys, dancing in the living room, in your arms, you rolling up the sleeves of my t-shirt, was I not real enough? You made me feel perfect and temporary, a bloom curious about eternity, a peach colored rose called cinnamon. I fix myself a dinner of dandelion wishes to be real, to be real, to be real. I sit on my yellow couch, sing along with Mac when he says, I think we just might be all right. I believe I will be all right. The rocks are aligned on the windowsill. The cutlery is asleep in the top drawer. Everything has its place. Your place is far from mine. Your face is far from mine. I think about missing you, I let it go. My hands do not shake when I remember. I can barely remember how to dance in the dark. So I buy candles. I've forgotten my name, dyed my hair, sunset the song, it skips, my heart gallops away. I went and you stayed behind. And then you got mad and told me not to come back. And then you got mad when I did not come back and did not talk to me anymore. And do not talk to me anymore. And when I came back, the first thing I did was forgive myself for how long it took to look in a mirror and see myself, to touch my own body and feel myself better than perfect, good as any flower. I am real. So that's a new one um, where I get angry at a person and that's that. Um, but let's get back to the regular scheduled programming of uh, myself. So I'm talking to depression and I'm just like, blah, 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 whatever. Sabrina who, I am whatever you last called me in my head, you know? Except I'm not nothing. I have a heavy pulse, which is a kind of thing like a zippity doo dah. Between my orgasms, I try not to cry. I laugh at all the jokes my friends say to me. On my birthday, I ask my grandmother for an apple pie. I draw a lot of lines. They don't mean a thing to you. You are an invisible bone that I caught and can't stop writing poems about. I mean, living, ha. Huh? I am the strangest of days, same as you. Who cares? 
I'm just trying to be less predictable these days. Anyway, you slip me a fog. You are molasses or something like molasses, whatever. I am softer than I think you are. Even if I have a mouth like a smoking gun that does not know where the bullets went. Quarantine pause. All right, um, another new one. This one's called Tomorrow Comes Anyway. It will be in my next book, but please don't ask me about it. I don't know when it's coming out or anything about it. My skin hurts and I don't like my hair. How lazy the curls. Tomorrow comes anyway. The sun is not inspirational. It is just on fire. The queen I have become is that of the uninspired. I was once queen of the fire bellies, fell in love with everyone I met, said nothing about my love. Let it grow and grow and grow until the whole of it one day gone, like the moon. The moon is aspirational. It can be here and invisible. I want you to know that is almost exactly how I feel about myself. I can be queen of disappearing from everywhere except the mirror. And it's easy to say a shadow is still a body. What exists cannot unexist, only burn out, fall out of orbit. My mind goes insane and a body is a body. Even if I look at my body and see a most misshapen thing, my skin, it physically hurts, but I don't want to die. I just want to lay on the road for a little bit while it rains and everything glistens. Rain queen of the glittering. So I rub my eyes with sparkles every day. I want to see the world this way. I want to look in the mirror and reflect my shine back so blinding, I don't see anything at all. Got on TikTok during this quarantine. Anybody else on TikTok? Check it out. It's a pretty all right place to uh, have a laugh and mindlessly scroll. Um, okay, let's keep it going with some insecurity poems. Why not? Uh, I recently started taking baths. I used to think it was disgusting. And um, then I just gave in and listened to self care on the internet. So here's a poem written from the bath. My insecurities are rioting in the back of my head. They possess an urgency so startling. I am avoiding all mirrors again. I am afraid to want anything. Even the smallest crumb for dinner feels like more than I deserve. So I am not eating. And then I am eating all of the time. I am terrified of what would happen if I missed a dose of medication. So I set three alarms on my cell phone, wrote take your pills in caps on a post-it note and stuck it on the mirror so it blocks my face. Look, I know it sounds strange, but most of the time for me, self-care is just surviving. And okay, I took a bath, but I only like it, it turns out, if there's a bath bomb. So I can make the water milky pink and scent it like a citrus grove. As long as the water obscures my frame, turns out I'm fine with baths. I like the time designated to just lay and think, though I have been overthinking everything lately. And I know it's ridiculous, but what if while in the tub, I slunk my entire self below the surface and sang the saddest song I've got in the back of my head until all that was left was just the soft hush of waves and not the piercing voice that says I don't deserve to be present. Not that this is about dying, nor does it have anything to do with wanting to drown because that's not even how I'd want to go out. To go out is all I want. To leave the house confident is what I want. To feel like I can be looked at and have the experience not make me want to apologize to the onlooker would be ideal. I feel like I have just been wearing this body. I want to take it off. So I've been slipping into waters a little more opaque. Pretend I'm laying naked and unashamed in the middle of a citrus grove, believing I am worthy of the beauty around me. Look, I think all I'm trying to say is I want the saddest song I've got to stop being the only song I am capable of singing in tune. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. All right, so uh, that's a poem about baths and weird body issues and happening like that. Um, okay, so let's uh, switch gears a little bit. My quarantine has kind of been 
made possible like I've been surviving it um because of my friends my friends have been really coming through on the video chats and the house parties and the zooms and the google duo and facetime and just like every platform you can imagine I've had to download it on my phone learn how to use it and then talk to all my friends that way so it's really a wonderful time for us all to connect um, and I'm just saying that, yeah, uh, this is a poem for my best friend, Shane, because I love him a lot. And I don't know what is, what is being a poet if you can't just talk about your friends. So this is a poem for Shane. I call and when he picks up the phone, he says he was so excited to see my name on the screen. It's two in the morning and I am having a Saturday night panic attack. The tears are streaming. I'm sitting on the ice covered curb. I thought fresh air would help, but now I'm just sobbing outside in a sweater that is not warm enough. But Shane answered the phone. He tells me that he loves me before asking me what's wrong. I tell him I don't know why I am crying, but that I can't stop. So I need him to just talk. He launches into a story about the bartender at this club he is at. And I start laughing, not because the story is funny, but because Shane picked up my call from inside of the club and is now telling me that I am not a burden over and over while I insist he go back to dancing. And he insists he has not stopped dancing. So it's really no problem at all. He's telling me all of this because he knows I need to hear it and his love is unselfish. He's always making sure I'm getting exactly Exactly what I need. It is so easy to love him back in the same way. Shane is my best friend, not only because he answers my calls in the club, but because he refuses to hang up from inside of the club until I rap a lyric and prove to him that I am truly okay. I take a deep breath and without thinking, I sing until, until there is no longer, let's just get lost inside these clouds. And he laughs. He says, all right, okay. And then we say, I love you at the same exact time before hanging up the phone. Cool. I don't know why I did finger guns. That wasn't that cool. Um, okay, so that's a poem on Shane. And now I'm gonna take it back to um, a poem from the book, if that's okay, for all my other pals um, who have kind of been really coming through in the clutch right now. I don't know if they're watching this because they're probably sick of hearing me say these poems over and over, but I do love them and I'm sure I'll see them in the house later. That's slang for the house party app. Um, it's pretty cool. On um, platonic love being a real thing. While drinking pear cider on E's rooftop for Kay's birthday, S asks, do you remember your first kiss? And I laugh. Yeah, of course. It was during a game of spin the bottle. Look, he is sitting across from us at this table right now. A senses our attention, looks at me mid bite of his hamburger, pulls it out of his mouth and opens up showing the product of his chewing. All three of us laugh and S says, oh, I totally get it. And I think about that game of spin the bottle how A was the only boy to come to my grade seven birthday party, how we still played spin the bottle and all kissed whoever it landed on. I think about how E was my prom date and the first girl I kissed with tongue, how that kiss was actually just a secret pact to make me promise not to tell H that E was smoking cigarettes. And that night when we slept over at H's house, K and I shared a bed and she took off her shirt and bra before she got in the bed. So I did too, and it was no thing. That time S and I spent the entire night laughing naked. I think about each relationship sitting at my table, how we trust each other with our whole bodies, how that's love. Now, isn't that love? Cool, so that's for all my pals. Love them all. Um, okay, a couple of new poems, and then we will close out this really, truly beautiful night of poetry. Um, Omar, you are like an electric, I, I, I said it was a wild ride, and like, I truly, it ended, and I was like, woo, that was beautiful, and then Rachel just really brought us, brought us right into our fields, right deeply into them. Ugh, that Tracy Turn Black poem, though. Let's go. And Adam, I've never had the pleasure of watching you do a set before, and... 
I think I'm a different person that I was before I watched that. So thank you for that. Um, I want to say you inspired me to sing, but I don't sing. So you inspired me to want to sing. Okay, uh, here's a new poem. It doesn't have a name. Uh, maybe you can hit me up with a title if you think of a good title, just like DM it to me or tweet it at me at badass underscore sav. Okay, I tell you this story from above a cloud in the sky, a cloud whose side I'll never leave. Okay, it's just my cloud. I have been falling asleep at its smoky feet each night. Come morning, dress in the dark. It does not matter if I forget my necklace or earrings. Keep forgetting which day of the week it is, but remember to eat breakfast. I swallow the good white bullet that poisons the place where the lonely breeds. I am dancing again in the kitchen, spicing sliced pears. I am baking again in the restful yawn of morning. In the afternoons, I go for walks through the cemetery, place pennies on the speller graves, sit cross in the grass cross-legged with the flowers and write a new religion where we pray only with and never to read poems aloud and remember my favorite lines onto postcards I will procrastinate sending to the people I love. I live alone. The cups are clean and upside down in the cupboard. Watercolor flowers instead of picking new wounds. When my tiny talk machine chirps, I do not always check it. I do not wish to see a ghost. Do not wish a summons. I allow myself to go entire days without speaking to anyone except my mother. I swallow two bullets blue each night for the ever grief, sleep. I have not used the word to depressed to describe myself outside of a poem in months, but I am drinking Diet Pepsi again. And I only drink Diet Pepsi when I'm depressed. The thing is my head is a bright place. I would not hesitate to invite you in. I've painted all the furniture marigold sunrise. Today at 7-Eleven, I asked for a lighter and do you know what color the cashier gave me? Yes, keep me in this yellow dream where I keep my lips soft and there is kissing, an abundance of kissing. I confess, sometimes I cry when I look in a mirror, but I tell myself it is the mirror who is crying of jealousy. And on the generous days, I tell myself I am sweet enough to spread on toast and call dessert. I giggle because I am not afraid to feel silly. I am not afraid to feel, period. I wish I wasn't so sad. <laughs> I have been in such a good mood. Want to know a secret? I think being in love is just a better kind of lonely. Cool. Um, cool, cool. Um, I just got a text that someone said they're impressed with my hair. So please tell Emily that I appreciate it. Um, because it's hella faded lavender right now and it looks way better on video than it does in real life. So I'm grateful for that. Okay, um, I kind of want to read this poem from the book and then close it out with a new one if that's okay. Uh, this is just a little guy for all of us. Uh, the short story of this poem is that one day I woke up and I tweeted, today is a good day to wake up and be great. I tweeted it for no reason at all other than I just felt shitty that day and thought I would put something inspirational out into the world and maybe that would like change the energy I was getting. Um, and that day I got an email saying that an urgent poem was needed for the Olympics and I ended up writing and voicing uh, like a national commercial for the Olympics that just had women winning medals uh, as a montage to my voice. And that was a dream come true. So yeah, this poem, I'm gonna do it and hopefully manifest all of this magic for us right now. Just women winning medals, let's manifest that. I am feeling better. So I say good morning and I mean it. Yes, today is a good morning to exhale, to feel joy with the release of a breath I no longer need to be holding. I am not alone because I feel alone. I am not alone because I feel alone. I am not alone because I feel alone with company. When I look in the mirror, I will find a reflection of the gifts I am withholding from myself. Light hits everything at a different angle, so I will make a habit of tilting my head. 
And when the sadness waterfalls, I will let the salt cleanse the wounds I cannot see. I will let dance parties be the hospitals I heal in. And if I need more help, I will let the people offering help me. If I need more help, I will let the medication help me. I forgive my body for being a machine after all. I forgive my memory for being the cupboard door that continues to pop a jar no matter how many times I shove that thing shut. I forgive myself. Even if I am the last person I want to forgive, whatever I have come from, wherever I am going, I will remember the present as the right place to start. Today is a good day to wake up and be great and have gratitude for the relentless pump of this heart, the way it does not know how to hold back. I exhale and I begin. Cool, cool, cool. Um, all right, so this is gonna be my last poem. It's a new one. It's called The Flowers, They Are Not Singing. Um, and it's, yeah, it's super new and it's about spring and spring is here. So there's still magic. There's still good news in this dreary, dreary world. There's still flowers is all I'm trying to say. I dreamt this up once long ago and here it is. A Sunday afternoon spent falling in love with myself. If this is what it is to be alive. If this is all it is, vampire weekend parading out the big white speakers that yes, I ordered on Amazon, forgive me, but they make me feel good. They have this ability to hook up to my record player and sing to me when I need the everlasting arms of song the most like this morning. After walking by the church with Mabel and swearing to God or Beyonce, I do not need another body. Even if my honey arms refuse to hold love inside of them, only throw themselves in the air in celebration of all this music then leave me to myself and lead me to myself the music it's alive and so am I sing 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 I did not die before I made it to 30 sing 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 my limbs shoot out in every direction call it praying dancing I am crying into the wind my body is making I am watering the flowers the tulips the carnations the marigolds and the mini roses that crowd my small apartment reminding me I too have returned to life thank the orange gerber daisies that sit on top of the white amazon speakers and sing 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 because today the flowers they are not singing i am cool thank you button poetry for throwing this live for all of us and getting us together on this quarantine saturday thank you everyone for coming and uh, i think i'm done I just want to say thank you so, so very much to all of our viewers out there. It's been lovely having you. Once again, my name is Tanisha Nicole, and I am currently the live events coordinator here at Button Poetry, and it's been uh, a real honor to be able to have such a successful virtual event. And um, I just wanted to take a moment to really let you know that, like, I miss this. I miss being able to be in a space with you entirely. And I look forward to the days when we can eventually do this again. But um, I also respect the amount of work that's being done to keep ourselves um, safe and to keep, uh, to keep the art and everything happening. And I just want to stress how important it is that we are really supporting our authors um, and our artists and people who are really impacted by this. I know we all kind of are, but if you can, if you have anything and you really want to tip and show your love, uh, please send all of them to the Button Poetry PayPal here on your screen. It is paypal.me slash button poetry. Um, we will be distributing that to all of our authors tonight. Um, and again, we are running this one day only sale. If you do QT5, you will get $5 off of every book that our authors read from tonight. Um, and it does work. Uh, it'll be a stackable coupon. So if you want to buy everyone's book, you'll get $5 off of every single book in your cart. Um, just make sure that you do... Um, Remember to put those pre-orders into separate carts so that you can get those discounts as well. As Rachel mentioned, they do ship a little differently because they're not out yet. Um, and 
again, thank you so very much to Adam and Sabrina and Rachel and Omar and uh, you as our audience for being here. And um, y'all can't see it, but there is some great work happening on the back end here. Spencer and Sam have been doing amazing tech for us all night to get this live stream up. So I really uh, appreciate them and wanna see some claps in the chat. And uh, just thank you. Thank you to the community and to Button and to all of you for making this possible. And I look forward to being able to see you again soon. So, bye.